Hi, I'm Greg Ulan with Reynolds and Reynolds, and this is Connected. Today's episode is really going to be a recap and a mashup of a lot of the conversations that we were able to have on the show floor at NADA just a few short weeks ago. Uh, some really engaging conversations, and the full episodes are all available on YouTube exclusively. So if you want to go out and watch or listen to those, please do so. Uh, first up, we have uh, Tolly Williams. Tolly is the fixed ops director at Nilo Company, uh, and this conversation was really exciting for me. Tolly's great and super passionate, and really understands his business. And, and this. Uh, talk right here goes into the expectation of doing it right 100% of the time and the difference that that makes in the dealership. So give it a listen. And that, and that's a great segue into, you know, how do we make sure our people are doing that job right? Yeah. By monitoring and metricing them. And I have televisions throughout our stores and websites for them to look at how they do every day to follow that procedure. They walk in, we take pictures of the car, we perform a tech inspection. We, we send a quote, the customer says yes or no. We send them a link to pay online. We have a flawless issue. And I think what happens a lot is that stores that say, yeah, we do that process 40% of the time. Right. We're 100% of the time. Yeah. I go crazy. So how do you, you just mentioned some some key points that you're looking at. Yeah. Um, are there specific metrics that you're looking for? Very much so. Okay, so great, great example. Yeah. So as you know, most everybody knows me, I'm an hours freak. I only care about the technician's hour. So it starts there in my book. Right. Right. And I look at, when I look at success at a store, it's all about making sure our people are successful and they make more money for them and their families. Right. Yeah. But it starts with making sure we have a technician base. And when you look at fixed ops, I don't care about the money. I'm going to say it one more time. I don't care about the money. I care about selling the hours. And if we focus on that hour of that technician, everything works better. So everybody's on the same page. For example, you know, back in the day, parts departments and sale and service departments, you know, who's paying the freight? The part's not coming for four years, right? But <laughs> if everybody knows that we care about selling 100% of our hours capacity, that means it's nine hours or 10 hours a day per technician, not how many right. hours are there. That's what we want per day when they're there, right? Yeah. Only fair. And we know that that is the focus and it's on everybody's pay plan. Right. So let's talk about that. So we have a capacity of say 4,000 hours for that store based on the workflow of that store. It has a number of techs times 10 hours a day, boom, done. Parts manager, service manager, same pay plan. Hours forecast, gross profit. Hours forecast is the key. Service advisor, hours forecast, paid on the gross. Hours is the key. Right. All of our bonuses for our team leads and foremans, hours forecast based on that. Parts counter people, hours forecast. Yes, I'm going to say it again. Parts counter people. Took a little bit to get that done. <laughs> but here's the deal. Now we're all focused on the same thing. So right. now a parts counter person is doing what? Get, our, get that part. Get that part to the tech. Right. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. There's no, there's no, we're not congregating at the back counter. Some of them don't even have back counters anymore. Yeah. It's a window. Right. It doesn't even open. <laughs> so I think that getting everybody on the same page delivers what we want. So now when we have the hours forecast built in, guess what we start doing? We want to check in the customer. We walk out to the car and take pictures to protect the dealer, mainly. Right. Let's just be honest. The next piece is, is that 100% cars are inspected. 100%. One mile, million miles is getting inspected. And I pay the technician. Yes, I pay the technician a half an hour to do the inspection do and half? video. Half an hour. But they're doing a, a video and an inspection. Okay. And here's the thing about that. Tell you, well, God, you're, you're, you're charging too much money for the tech. I disagree. I mean, I, I wish I could pay more <clears throat> because happy techs make you money. Two is I'm paying them. Guess what I get to do? I have expectations I can hold them accountable to. Yeah. So what we look at on our inspections are is that we want to make sure that the tech recs per car on a mileage band is correct. Over or under recommending is horrible. Right. And I like to say we sell recommendations. We'd sell our family members. So. Would you sell it to your family or no? The market is a green. Yeah. <clears throat> right? I mean, that's the, it, is, it is what it is. Sure. So making sure we have honesty and integrity there. I really enjoyed that conversation with Tolly. He is a guy that is extremely passionate. He's extremely bright and he knows his business. Uh, lots of great nuggets to pull out of that conversation. So if you want to go check out the full episode, please do so. Uh, next up, staying in the fixed ops world, I got to sit down with Warner Jones. Uh, Warner is a senior vice president of product at True Video. Uh, and he goes into some details in this snippet about how to incentivize text to use video in the service drive, right? To, to get that video captured done and out to the customer because it will inevitably increase closing ratios. So take a listen to this one with uh, with Warner Jones. 
kind of leads into a couple questions. The first one, and it's maybe it's a two part question. So the first one is what's the most effective way to train technicians to do this? Um, and the follow up is when the technician doesn't want to do it or isn't good at it, what are the other options? You know, is there, are there other ways to do it outside of having the technician his or herself do it? Yeah. So it, 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 it there's, there's a few pieces to that. Um, you know, there is a process when you look at a dealership and, and what does a successful installation look like at a dealership, um, you definitely need management buy-in. Yep. Uh, you need to have a champion who cares about it and especially early on looks at it every day. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's good before the installation actually happens to have meetings with each of your groups. And the messaging to each group is going to be a little bit different. The message to the technicians is going to be, um, have you ever felt that the advisors never sold your work? Would you like to speak directly to the customer, right? And you can really talk to that technician group. And then the advisor group is going to be a slightly different message and so forth. So that preparation leading up to the installation is really important. Um, we do in the book, I actually ad address five objections. Okay. And, um, you know, one of the key objections that is overcome is uh, that selling of work. And video, what we found is video fixes this communication chain in the dealership. So uh, usually a technician uncovers five or six items, tells the advisor, and then the advisor tells the customer about three or four of those right. items. And you wonder why, and maybe the advisor was busy or maybe the advisor was syncing with their own wallet and not the customer's wallet. And for maybe they didn't trust that the technician was actually telling the truth sure. and was trying to oversell. And so that communication chain, whatever the recommendations were, not all of them end up getting to the customer. Right. And so when you educate the technician, you say, listen, 100% of your recommendations are going to get to the customer 100% of the time, unfiltered and unedited. That can really bring people around. Yeah. But sometimes you still do have issues with convincing technicians and we'll recommend uh, paying an incentive. Um, some dealerships will pay one tenth. They'll pay two tenths. I've seen three to five tenths of an hour to do the video. Now, do, you so, do, that? do they do that? forever or is that like kind yeah. of a ramp up you know six months or three months or something like that to get get the habit built what, yeah. what do you see yeah we've seen both okay um i think a lot of people think incentive to get it going and then we're going to pull it away but we have dealers that actually leave it in place and they said oh i'd, I'd pay that money all day long for the improved csi and the customer retention and so yeah. forth so we've seen it both sides um the nice thing about it is now that you, if you're paying a three dollars a video or a tenth for for each video recorded, sure. you're, you're actually paying your technicians more money. So you have a better ability to retain your uh, technicians because they actually make more money, and recruiting technicians becomes easier because now you have this extra incentive. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. that's a good idea. Warner's great, and if you liked what he said, I'd encourage you to go out and check out his book. It's available on Amazon, The Ultimate Guide to Inspection Videos. Make sure to get your get your copy out there, and I'm sure he'll he'll get you one into your hands. Um, next up, again, staying in kind of this fixed ops world, I got to sit down with uh, Ed Roberts, who's the COO, and Jeff King, who's the general manager at Bozard Ford Lincoln down in Florida. And, and these two are mastering the art of mobile service. It's working really well for them. They're expanding very, very fast. And uh, we talked a lot about uh, efficiency. And, and we often talk about dead bay time and making sure that, that vehicles aren't just sitting on lifts waiting for approvals or that bays are empty in the, in the dealership and maximizing what you can get out of your service drive. This conversation actually led into uh, dead van time. So thinking about mobile service and making sure that vans aren't just on the road or worse sitting uh, without getting work done. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, in mobile service, efficiency is as important or more important than it is in the service drive itself in your in your shop. Uh, so take a listen to this conversation. I thought it was very interesting. As, as we ramp up our remote services, uh, the more vehicles we have, the less uh, dead road time That's that true. they have driving yeah. from place to place. Yeah. Um, if you're trying to cover a geographic area with four vans, um, they have to go all over the place. But if you can, with as many vans as we have, uh, we can put them into very tight geographical locations yeah. and you know, it's cutting down on the road time that they have from place to place. Yep. Now, we still have to make sure that they have the right tools and the right parts that are on the van when, when they get there. So there's a lot of logistics that, uh, that we still have to have to perfect. Right. But, um, but a lot of it is overcome, quite honestly, with going all in and not dipping your toe in the water anymore. Yeah, so with, go ahead. And it's setting expectations as well. And, and it isn't that we just say, hey, you're, we're gonna put you in mobile. They have to earn their way into it and they have to earn their way to stay into it. 
and that's what the expectations. You got to set the expectations and hold them to it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So, how big? So, with with going into fifty vans this summer, right? Um, you you got to have a dispatcher. You got to have somebody manage this. How big is the team that's managing the mobile operation? Because I think about that. I mean, that's that in theory could be its entire back parts counter, right? Like, how do you how do you manage that? So. Um, we have, uh, as about 30 days ago, I think, we uh, opened up a separate division of remote operations. Okay. So we now have a fixed operations director that manages everything that happens at the dealership. And we have a remote operations director that is of equal on the org chart. Sure. So you know, they're both two equals and they're both working together to service our customers better. Yeah. But we realize that remote services is going to be as big as fixed operations. So. Right. right. And to speak at it from a number standpoint, we're going to have more people in remote services than the average dealer has out there. And that doesn't need to scare dealers away from doing it because right. you got to crawl before you can walk and you got to walk before you can run. Yeah, you started with one van at one point, right? Exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. So the uh, as far as the number of people that we'll see in it, we'll be at 80 people in there by the by summertime. And, yeah. it, and it's, it's, it's a whole department in itself. So yes, there is parts people, there is advisors, there is dispatchers, um, there's there's fill-in technicians because when you're running 50 people, 50 vans, and somebody calls in or somebody's on vacation, right. that van still needs to roll. So you got yeah. to move those guys around so that there'll, there'll be mobile guys that, mo that that move into a van that may be in one van today and different van tomorrow. Ed and Jeff did just a great job, and they're really pushing the mobile service industry forward. I love what they're doing, rooting them on. I can't wait to see where they take this mobile service industry because it's it's their leaders there, and uh, there's a bright, bright future. So watch out for them and keep your ears and eyes open for uh, for advice that they have on, on what they're doing as they grow. Uh, next up, we have Cliff Banks. Cliff is one of my favorite people in the automotive industry. Uh, always appreciate his perspective. Cliff is the uh, founder of the Banks Report and Autovate uh, and seems to have massive influence across the industry and is always leading with his thoughts. Uh, this little snippet dives into his views on the connected car, um, where it is today, where it can go, and if we're ever going to get there. So take a listen. All right, so Cliff, one of the other things that you always seem to have great perspectives on, and you, you have different ideas than pretty much anybody else around the connected car. Yes. Um, so what's what's new in that world? What are you seeing? What are you excited about? You know, it, it just it's, it's a world that seems to have endless opportunity. Endless opportunity, but it's... Darn near impossible. <laughs> you know, I, and I mean, you know, we've talked about this for the last few years. I, my vision of where I thought the connected vehicle now, and I think the term now is software defined vehicle, SUV, sure. uh, uh, which I think we need to put to bed. But <laughs> uh, the, um, I don't, I don't know the manufacturers are going to be able to pull off some of the thoughts that I had in terms of, tying everything together yeah uh um we're not you know tesla is one but that's a different you know they, they've been able to do it from the ground up i think with ford general motors still in toy any of them it's just uh it's just very hard i there's gonna be some disappointed investors who were banking on this 20 to 30 billion dollars in revenue additional revenue annually that the automakers have been talking about there's no yeah just we're so it, it's so hard it is it yeah. is so hard i mean you take rivian the other day i mean uh, R rivian they they did an over-the-air update and bricked their infotainment center right it, you know i i think these these things are uh are challenging um you're not uh, it's not in their skill set really uh um and, and you have multiple you have multiple suppliers so you're relying on on them to produce right. uh, things that can be connected. Uh, I think the vehicle infrastructure still isn't set up yet yeah. to be able to to manage all of those functions. You have the cybersecurity issue yeah. issues, um, but yeah, I mean, I would love to be able to get into my car and and have it talk to me and tell me what's going on with the vehicle. Now, what, what is fascinating when we're starting to see. You know, we've seen Mercedes, I think, uh, and, and there's other manufacturers that are starting to play with AI, natural language yeah. models, and tying it into their voice right. activate or, you know, voice uh, systems. 
now that is if they can get that to work without too many bugs right you know but you know <laughs> I, you know, you get in the car and, and ask where the traffic is and, and it verbally tells you, but maybe it doesn't give you the right answer. Right. Yeah. But I, but if, if you're ever, if the manufacturer's ever able to tie that AI to the actual mechanical systems yeah. in the vehicle to tell you when you need an oil change or, you know, I say, I mean, it could be an EV, but, or you need new tires or new brakes, you could, uh, you know, I think... You know, that that could be a, a game changer. That was a fun conversation with Cliff, as always. I'll tell you, it's going to be a sad day, the day that I don't get to sit down with Cliff Banks at NADA. So, Cliff, if you're out there, thank you so much for your for your time, as always. I hope everybody uh, gets so much out of the conversation as I do. Uh, next up, I got to sit down with two different uh, presidents of ADAs, and they're in very different states. So, South Dakota and Florida. Uh, first up is Christine Vinatieri Erickson. Uh, Christine is the president of the South Dakota Auto Dealers Association. Uh, she also serves as president of the South Dakota Trucking Association. So, two roles that are... Are, uh, adjacent, but but not identical. So it was a very interesting conversation. But in this snippet, we get into uh, really how you know different states vary and how federal regulations can have a really broad impact, even unintentionally. She gets into EVs in South Dakota and how that market is so much different than other parts of the country. So give it a listen. Um, the other thing is, is you know, working for two boards, yeah. similar industries, but very different <laughs> industries. Um, so it's really balancing your time. And right now, um, I really need to focus on um, the changes in the automotive world. Right. Uh, and that's where a lot of my focus uh, has been over the last several months now. Yeah. So what are you seeing in, in South Dakota specifically? Yeah. Right. Because it is you bring up a good point and why your role in these organizations across the country is so important. Absolutely. Um, geography matters. Right. Demographic. Right matter this isn't there's never gonna be a one-size-fits-all solution right. to, to any problem really right, right? It, there's all these variables that go into pretty much everything that we do right so in your world right in South Dakota what are what are you chasing what's what's top of mind what are you going so after? you know as we see all these really really problematic changes coming out of the federal government whether it's the the shopping rule or zero emissions um, we're, we're really being mindful of that because in South Dakota, you can't have a, a, a big, maybe truck EV hauling your cattle down the road. It right. just doesn't work. You're not well, going to not get. especially not in January. No, I mean, we just had <laughs> negative 40 degree uh, wind chill last week. And I mean, my kids didn't have school for two days. They were going to school late then. Uh, it just doesn't work for everyone. Um, we are prepared to sell whatever the consumer wants, but yeah. that's what's important. What does the consumer want? This should not be government led. This really needs to be about the consumer. So we're not anti EV. We're not anti hybrid. We're not anti ice. We will sell whatever you want. Right. Right. Well, that's, that's a good point. And you know, the, the, Government and responsibility is a strong word, but they have right. a perspective that a they role. want to. Yeah, they, they want to progress and and keep things moving forward. And um, you know, the the emission standards are mm -hmm. a part of that. Right. Um, but there also has to be a solution. Right. Right. You can't right. you can't mandate a. a it's not even a solution. You can't make it a, a yeah. suggestion right. um, if it doesn't work. No. And so. I, I will give you this example to think about and for the the, um, the people watching right now to, to think of too. EVs are very very heavy. So they are. picture uh, uh, an EV semi, okay? Yep. They can only haul so much weight per regulation, right? So you now put this super heavy EV on the road and oh, by the way, how do our dealerships get cars? Semis, okay, so right. the semi is gonna then haul EVs on the back uh, of the semi, yeah. which are also heavier. Unless you're carrying pillows or feathers, it's just not gonna work. <laughs> and so, and plus that range anxiety. So we want to embrace technology. Mm -hmm. We want to um, find better solutions. Uh, in my opinion, I, I think that plug-in hybrid is going to be a really, really good thing for yeah. places like South Dakota. Christine is doing a great job in her role, or should I say roles. Um, and if if you're ever interested in running for office, I'd recommend watching the full episode with Christine. She gets into some details about her campaign, how she raised money, how she went about getting elected. Uh, and it's really insightful. So, so give that one a watch or a listen if you have a chance. Uh, next up, I got to talk with Ted Smith, who is the president of the Florida Auto Dealers Association. Uh, Ted's been in that role for quite a while. He's doing great things down in Florida. He's very passionate. Uh, this snippet, he goes into what he's doing and what the uh, Florida Auto 
Dealers Association is doing to protect the franchise system in Florida, to protect their dealers in Florida. Um, and he, he really goes into some details. So give this a listen. We're very concerned about how some OEMs are beginning to think that they need to go around the very best system, the one that you just described. Right. The franchise system is the best. There is no direct sale model that's going to benefit consumers. But more importantly, in Florida, Hyundai, for instance, some years sure. ago, decided that they, the Genesis was delivered to all the Hyundai dealers and they were selling it. And then they said, oh, it's a new vehicle. And they wanted to take it out of the line make and set it up as a separate company. Right. Now, that's legal in Florida and in a lot of states, as long as you use the existing Hyundai dealers. Well, Hyundai dealers already were selling the right. Genesis. So they attempted to set up a separate line make uh, license in Florida. I went to the DMV and said, that's not possible. That car is a, is a Hyundai. They're gonna use Hyundai dealers. So they wanted to have 12 Hyundai dealers in Florida. And we said, no, you have 42. They went to have 12 Gen Genesis dealers, sure. excuse me. Yep. They had 42 Hyundai dealers. They tried to set up a different license. DMV said, we agree with FADA. You're gonna, we will give you a line make license for Genesis, but it will be for all 42 dealers. Good. That's the way the, the law works. But right. now we have these, the new Amazon situation. We're not sure what that's going right. to look like. But at the end of the day, last year in the legislature, we went to the legislature and said, it's clear that dealers uh, shouldn't have competition from their OEMs. Yes. Now, we do have direct selling manufacturers, Tesla, Rivian, and Lucid. Sure. But they've never had dealers. So Correct. we created in our law a difference between us and them. We did that because we knew that other programs like Scout and VW were coming. So we made a clear differentiation. We also said very succinctly that an OEM cannot start up a dealership, but they also can't let one of their subsidiaries get into competition with their dealers. Yeah. So we put a 30% ownership up or down. If you have that, you can't be involved in that as an OEM if you have a dealer network. Yeah. So we address the ownership issue. We address their entry into the business directly or indirectly. Ted's doing great things down in Florida, and his passion really shows through. The dealers down there are lucky to have him. Uh, next up, we shift gears a little bit, and I got to have two conversations, two unique conversations, with students at Northwood University in Midland, Michigan. A couple of different conversations, but the first one was with Grace Haynes. Grace is a, uh, a senior this year. She's actually graduating with a master's degree here coming up in, a, in just a couple of months, and out looking for you know kind of her first step in her career. So we talked about her experience at NADA and contrasting it with some internships she's had. Uh, pretty insightful conversation. What have been, you know, it's been a jam-packed few days, yeah. right? Um, what have been some of the the top takeaways or top learnings maybe that you have uh, coming out of this couple of days? Yeah, so a big one I know a lot yesterday was like AI, which I know everyone's talking about, but that's what we spend a lot of time, like us and me and other students, going around to the different AI booths and kind of like hearing how everybody's doing it different, learning about their competitive advantage and how everybody's utilizing it and how much room there is to grow. So just kind of learning all the new technologies that we're not necessarily seeing on a day-to-day -day basis, just like from the outside, like as a customer in the automotive industry, but instead seeing it like on the retailer side and how that's going to be utilized and how they're looking at how it can benefit customers. So that's been super big. Next up is Brooke Engelhart. Brooke uh, sat down and talked with me about how you as a dealer can recruit the next generation of talent. So Brooke is a junior at Northwood University, and she gave some great insight into what interests her, what she expects in an employer, how you can pull her and her peers into the dealership. So really valuable information. Uh, listen to this snippet, but I also, I'd also encourage you to go out and listen to the full episode. She does a great job explaining things. And what do you think are some of the key bullet points for the message, right? As you're looking at, as you're starting to think about your career and what you want to do next in your life, um, what are the things that draw you in? I mean, are you, is there anything specific you're looking for in, in a company or, you know, when you think about the organization that you'll be a part of or in a career, when you think about the, really the tasks, the work that you're going to be doing, are there specific things that would draw you in? So yeah, I'm going to advertise on these different platforms, right? Mm, and and yeah. I'm going to be mobile, but what's the message? Yeah. Um, very plain and simple, but honestly, just putting the employee first and that employee putting the customer first. So I would want to make sure that um, if I was a dealer to 
be able to promote to the general public is, hey, we would love to have you join our company. And um, we just, any benefits towards that employee that could ben truthfully benefit them right. would just be amazing to have. Um, I have noticed for companies that I've worked for, sometimes it's more focused on the customer and it should be, truthfully. But if I'm working for a company and they're not putting me first, sure. I feel like I really can't put the customer first. And that can be a barrier to have to try and hop over, or jump over. And so um, I think that just putting uh, your employees first, that's going to help them want to put their customers first. And it just it's full circle. I'm so glad both Brooke and Grace could join us at NADA. They did a fantastic job. Uh, and I'll tell you what, the future is definitely bright for automotive with, with young folks like that coming in. Uh, next up, I got to sit down with somebody on the other end of the spectrum, the legendary alpha dog, Jim Ziegler and his wife, Debbie. Uh, they came in the booth and, and sat down. We had a great conversation. Got some insight from Jim on how he views the selling process of F&I products, specifically in relation to remote customers and, and how to get engaged with them rather than just letting them self-select. Uh, give this a listen and uh, see what you think. Yeah, and when you ask consumers too, I mean, we've done a lot of studies and, and surveys with consumers recently, and, and one of the most valuable interactions that they have when we, when we surveyed them, you know, so go through the sales process. Where do you see value? What would you pay more for? And one of the most valuable was the interaction with the F&I manager because they want to be educated. They don't understand these products, right? So, so there's value in the products, which is why they, why they get sold and why consumers there buy them. There's a lot ultimately. of value in the products. I am a big advocate. The whole world has gone uh, video. The whole, world's, the whole world's talking on FaceTime. The sure. whole world is talking on social media. I, I make a living right now with video. Right. So why not have a built into the websites and built into the first visit some opportunity for the customer to interact with a live person, an F&I manager, to do what they expected the videos to do, a Zoom-type broadcast. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good call. So are you seeing um, are you seeing dealers move to that model where it's, it, it is a FaceTime call or a Zoom call or whatever it might be in there? And what does that interaction look like? Are they selling in that instance? Or are they uh, building a relationship? What does that interaction look like, that first pass? Well, a lot of that's coming out of the BDCs. Okay. You know, we're, we're a lot a lot more FaceTime, a lot of Zoom-type uh, broadcast. And a lot of that's coming about. That's, that's still in the development. That's not, that's not mainstream yet. I really appreciate Jim and Debbie stopping by. It was a great conversation. Uh, check out the full one if you get the chance. Jim also has a new book available on Amazon, so make sure to check that out. Uh, next up, we have Justin Osterley. Justin is the CEO of Route One, uh, a well-known company, obviously. And it was an interesting conversation because not too long ago, we were talking about how to move from paper to electronic when it comes to contracting. And in, in a, just a few short years, we've gotten to the point where most deals, uh, Justin said 70% which I would have guessed higher, but 70% uh, of deals are being e-contracted at this point. So we started to get into what are the hurdles for those that aren't e-contracting or how do we get that last 30% over the hump? And it really came down to utilization and getting a user, an F&I manager, to 10 deals. If they can get to 10 deals, he said, uh, you get them utilizing e-contracting fully. So give us a listen, some really good tips and steps in here from Justin Osterley. There's, there's not a lot of dealers that aren't e-contracting uh, on some level, right? Most of them are doing it fairly regularly, um, if not trying to be entirely in an e-contracting environment. I mean, you're going to have deals where you have to go through a specific lender for different use cases. But for the most part, I was in I was in a room we were talking before we started recording. I was in a room yesterday with 150 dealers and I asked the question. I said, OK, show of hands. Whose preferred lender is not e-contracting? And no hands went up. Right. So for the most part, everybody's everybody's there. But that doesn't mean that they're all doing it the same way or that, that it's efficient or that it's not difficult. So from your perspective and what you see, what are some of the biggest hurdles uh, when dealers are e-contracting, whether it's with the, the dealer, whether it's with the lender or some somewhere in between? What are some of those big hurdles to, to look out for that can maybe be overcome? Yeah, I think the, the biggest single thing, and it's a, a boring answer, but people who work <laughs> in dealerships will hear it a lot, is just how hardened in processes are and how resistant to change things can be when those processes are so well adopted over a long period of time. It's not always obvious to an operator that there could be a better or more efficient way. And even if they get the idea of a better or more efficient way as a, as a concept, 
putting the work in to do it can be a challenge. Yeah. So it's some of the uh, some of the ways we measure things are reflective of of that. When we have a, a dealership who does any one e contract, we don't consider that they are converted over for e contracting. Right. There's a magic number of ten per for a user. Okay. If we can get an individual user to have done ten, they generally see it is more efficient, better for them, better for the customer. Sure. But if they do one or two and then they get in a hurry and they go back to the old way, it takes some time to get them back. So it is resistance to change, I think, is the biggest thing. And again, it's because people are busy on the one hand and they know how to operate it on the other. Getting over that objection, once we get to that, them to that 10th contracting, gets pretty sticky. Yeah. And to your point, I think there is enough of a track record now at the industry level in terms of adoption. We are demonstrating value. Right. People don't adopt things for fun. People adopt things because... They can do it better or it makes them money. Right. One of those two things. In this case, it's both. Yeah. So there's a there's a lot of energy, I think, in the market. But I, I would say, uh, just to, to frame it a bit in terms of where we are with adoption, about two-thirds, a little more than two-thirds of dealers are taking advantage of e-contracting. Okay. That's pretty good adoption. Yeah. But there I is still opportunity. Higher, yeah, there is still opportunity to go further. Mm-hmm. And some... Some OEMs are at 90%. Sure. Toyota's there. Ford is there. Hyundai's very close to there. So there are some lenders who have demonstrated it and gotten it well adopted in their dealer body for the deals that are done with the captive. Everybody outside of those captives, we measure them separately. So if you exclude the big guys, mm-hmm. it's about 70% adoption of e-contracting okay. overall. 70%, 7 in 10 deals that could be e-contracted are. Yeah. So again... That's a pretty good number, especially since we started at zero several years ago. <laughs> but there's all, there's still opportunity, we believe, to further penetrate and, and just capture the value that's on the table for dealers and for finance sources. Justin Osterley and Route One are doing a great job helping the industry move forward with e-contracting, getting from that 70% to 100%, uh, and getting everyone on board and on the same page from lenders to vendors to dealers to consumers, making sure that we all are connected and have the tools that we need to be successful. So Justin, thanks for sitting down and talking. Uh, So last up, I got to sit down with Mike Hanna. Mike is the CEO and founder of TrueSpot. TrueSpot is a location services company. So I think uh, one of the most interesting examples is keys. Put a tag on a key, you know exactly where it is. There's a lot of services out there uh, where you know who has the key, but not specifically where it's located. Uh, In this snippet, we talk about their technology versus something more general like uh, RFID as an example. And he gets into some technical details, which I really liked and appreciated. Uh, This is definitely a technical founder that knows what he's doing. He's built a great company and a great technology. So check it out. I found the, the conversation very interesting. So what is the, um, and I don't want to get too technical. We can go, I guess we can if you want to, but, um, and people can obviously learn more at, at truespot.com, but um, what's the anchor technology? So I think about it, right? And you have these tags that right. uh, go on whatever you want to put them on a key or a car yeah. or whatever. Um, and you can track wherever they are. You can, there's all these different and sensors, I believe, that pick up the tag. Correct. So how does it compare to like RFID technology? What is it the same thing? Is it different? How does it compare? Yeah, it's a great question. So the the tags, it's very multimodal from a technology perspective. So uh, one of the things that we do just compared to to RFID, RFID is a very much touch and and, and manual uh, uh, process is needed. So not only it's RFID, you can deploy it and that sort of thing, but you actually have to be really close proximity with uh, whatever you're tracking. So if it's an RFID tag on something, you almost have to touch a gate. Okay. And so it, it takes a step. So if you're uh, in a car dealership or in a hospital, which we, we also uh, track assets and things there, uh, you actually have to touch. And really probably the biggest market for RFID uh, and location tracking was hospitals. Uh, just big need for that. But those systems largely failed because you'd have to have a nurse or somebody touch actually the asset they're tracking to an actual gate. And so it just created extra steps. And anytime you have to give a human extra things to do, sometimes and somewhere it's going to fail. Right. And if it fails one time, when the user actually goes to use it and it's not where it's supposed to be, then it kind of fails for everything. But the difference between RFID is very localized. Uh, so in our tags, we have a proprietary version of Bluetooth Low Energy okay. um, that we've kind of built and optimized through the years to do power efficiency and all the little cool things that that really make the system work differently and better than, than anything else. Um, but you don't have to touch it to anything. It's broadcasting at a 100 to 300 foot range or radius. Hmm. Um, and so when that happens and then it connects to what we'll call one of our gateways, uh, we also manage, own, and operate a low power radio technology that backhauls uh, all that data back to our cloud. So not okay. to get uh, too geeky with it, but 
uh, we, we function just like a private network operator. Like a, I, I say it like we're like a mini AT&T, okay. uh, but at a campus level. So the system we deploy allows you to track everything kind of in real time, great fidelity from a location perspective, but we're not worried about anything else. No IT concerns, no Wi-Fi concerns, no power concerns because of the low power uh, capability of the system, we can do things on solar and battery power that allows us to plug and play a network at a dealership, at a hospital, anywhere else, huh. uh, do it at a price point that nobody can match, at a performance level uh, that there is no equal to in the market. And that's a wrap on the conversations on the show floor at NADA. Thanks so much for joining me today. It was fun going back through and watching and listening to those conversations. Uh, it gets me very excited and energized for how far we've come and where we're headed. It's going to be a great year in 2024. Uh, so again, thanks so much. And don't forget, before we hop off, you can watch or listen to all episodes of Connected on YouTube, Apple, or Spotify podcasts. And make sure to hit subscribe so you're notified every other week when new episodes are released. Thanks so much, and we'll see you in two weeks.